Welcome to Historic Adventures YouTube. Today, we embark on a journey to Boomeris Castle. Step back in time, where a path winds along the southern edge of a formidable moat, leading to the grand entrance of the castle. Here, amidst the whispers of centuries past, remnants of an ancient stone wall lie in quiet testimony to a bygone era. To the right of a sturdy wooden bridge, traces of low foundations stand as silent sentinels, echoes of a strategic vision conceived by the illustrious Edward I. Much like his famed fortifications at Cairnafon and Conwy, it is believed he intended to envelop his new town with protective walls from its inception. Yet, the grandeur of the Beaumarie circuit, this sentinel of stone, was not realized until the early 15th century, following the tumultuous Glyndwa Rebellion. In the late 13th century, this particular segment, standing at a modest height of merely two feet, served not only as a barrier, but also as a dam, its sluice gates controlling the waters of the encircling moat. Where the journey across the threshold of time begins, at the outer gate of the castle, a gateway steeped in the annals of ages past. Referred to in the annals of 1343 as the gate beside the sea, it stood as a sentinel against the turbulent tides of history. In the medieval tapestry of arrangement, this gateway held a pivotal role. The bridge leading to its hallowed entrance was no mere structure but a drawbridge, its timbers echoing with the creak of ancient ropes and the clang of chains. Through two apertures above the archway, these lifelines traversed, binding the passage to the realm beyond. Here, where land meets sea and history meets destiny, the outer gate beckons, a silent witness to the ceaseless dance of waves and the eternal passage of time. Step beyond the formidable defences of the South Gatehouse and you enter the heart of Bomares Castle, the Inner Ward. Here, Amidst the echoes of history lies a space both vast and enigmatic. Though the present expanse may appear spacious, it belies a rich tapestry of planned structures that once graced this courtyard. Among them, the imposing gatehouses, guardians of the castle's inner sanctum, stand as silent sentinels, their stories etched in the annals of time. In the Chronicles of Construction, we glimpse a vibrant tableau of medieval life. Documents from the era speak of bustling activity, of people going about their daily tasks within these walls. The constable, steward of the garrison, held court within the castle, attended by his retinue and household, a testament to the power and prestige vested in his office. In the year 1297, the commands of Edward I echo through the corridors of history, as the constable is tasked with mustering a formidable force. Horsemen, crossbowmen, craftsmen, and clergy, each playing their part in the defense and administration of the realm. Amidst the clamor of construction, amidst the ring of hammers and chisels, masons toil to carve stone balls for the mighty trebuchets, while women such as Cecilia of Kent ply their trade fashioning horsehair ropes for the fearsome springolds that guard the castle's ramparts. Yet beyond the realm of war and duty lies the heartbeat of daily life. Here, within the castle walls, cooks and servants bustle about their tasks, their labor sustaining both body and spirit. And in the courtyards, a bustling marketplace unfolds as townsfolk and soldiers alike engage in the commerce of daily existence. Thus, within the inner ward of Bomaris Castle, history and humanity intertwine, weaving a tapestry of life and legacy that endures through the ages. Behold, the Wall Walk, a passage through the annals of history where every step carries the weight of centuries past. Ascend the spiral stair within the western turret of the North Gatehouse, and emerge onto the towering ramparts. Here, amidst the whispers of time, awaits a vista unlike any other. Gaze downward and behold the intricate interior of the North Gatehouse, 
a testament to the craftsmanship of old. Yet, the journey has only just begun. Traversing the wall walk, one is treated to a spectacle of architectural marvels. Trace the scars of ancient roofs, each bearing witness to the passage of time and the trials of yore. Along the southern parapet, five window embrasures beckon, their stone seats worn smooth by the touch of countless hands. Here, where the second floor once stood, now lies a testament to adaptation, a roof inserted to accommodate changing needs. A timber platform spans the divide, connecting the spiral stair to the wall walk proper. Supported by medieval corbels, this structure served as a lifeline, its very existence a testament to the castle's resilience in times of crisis. Gaze northward and witness the castle's concentric plan unfold before your eyes. From this vantage point, the inner curtain rises majestically, offering a commanding view over the outer ward below. Beyond lies a tapestry of land, stretching beyond the moat's edge, a reminder of the world beyond these ancient walls. Though time has weathered their stones, the wall walks remain steadfast, beckoning travellers to embark on a journey through the annals of history. While only the northern and western sections stand open to visitors today, they serve as portals to a bygone era, where the echoes of the past linger in every stone and every step. Enter now the outer ward, a space suspended between the twin embrace of curtain walls, where the whispers of centuries past still linger in the air. In the days of yore, this expanse teemed with life as buildings of stone and timber rose to touch the heavens. Alongside the outer gate, remnants of a bygone era stand testament to the bustling activity that once filled this space. Corbels, weathered by time, bear witness to the roofs they once supported, sheltering weary travellers and craftsmen alike. Elsewhere, amidst the shadows of the inner curtain wall, stone footings mark the footprint of workshops, stables and sheds, each echoing with the sounds of industry and trade. Yet, the outer curtain wall stands as a silent sentinel, its architecture a testament to the ingenuity of generations past. Along the southern stretch, arches bear the weight of a wall walk, added in a time of strife and uncertainty, a testament to the castle's ever-evolving defences. At ground level, loopholes pierce the thick stone, their gaze ever vigilant against the spectre of invasion. Yet, time has taken its toll, and many of these once vigilant eyes now lie dormant, their purpose forgotten by the passage of ages. Small turrets punctuate the circuit, their levels bristling with loops, while the towers at the northwest and northeast corners offer respite from the rigors of the day, their hearths casting a warm glow amidst the chill of the castle walls. Amidst the stones, hidden beneath low stone roofs, lie the latrines, a humble reminder of the necessities of daily life amidst the grandeur of fortress walls. Yet, amidst the ruins, glimpses of grandeur endure. The foundation of a wall, dating to the late 1290s, stands as a silent testament to the castle's expansion, a bulwark against the encroaching tides of time. Though some towers and walls have succumbed to the ravages of time, their memory lives on, echoing through the corridors of history as a testament to the resilience and fortitude of those who once called this place home. The genesis of this mighty fortress can be traced back to the year 1284, when plans were first envisioned. Yet, the dream lay dormant, shackled by the chains of fiscal scarcity. It wasn't until 1295, following the eruption of the Madog ap Llewellyn uprising, that the first stones were laid. Under the watchful eye of the esteemed James of St. George, a legion of labourers toiled ceaselessly, their sweat mingling with the dust of history as they labored to give form to Edward's vision. But fate, it seems, had other designs. 
Edward's gaze soon turned northward towards the Scottish borders, draining the coffers that had once flowed freely for Beaumaris. Construction slowed to a crawl, halted by the exigencies of warfare. It wasn't until the spectre of invasion loomed once more in 1306 that the hammers and chisels were roused from their slumber. And yet, despite the Herculean efforts and the staggering sum of 15,000 pounds poured into its walls a princely sum, in those times Beaumaris Castle remained a work in progress. Its ramparts, though formidable, whispered tales of dreams unfulfilled, of aspirations left dangling like threads in the wind. By the year 1330, the echoes of hammers had faded, the clamour of labourers silenced, leaving behind a monument to ambition tempered by the harsh realities of the age, a castle incomplete, a legacy unfinished. In the annals of Welsh history, a chapter unfolds amidst the towering walls of Beaumaris Castle, where the echoes of defiance reverberated in the year 1403. The rebellion of Owain Glyndwa, a moment of fervent nationalism, saw the fortress fall into the hands of Welsh forces, a testament to the indomitable spirit of a people yearning for freedom. Yet, as the tides of war ebbed and flowed, so too did the fortunes of Bumaris. In the year 1405, royal forces, determined to reassert their dominion, stormed the ramparts once more. The clash of steel against stone, the thunder of hooves upon cobblestones, heralded the return of sovereignty as Beaumaris Castle was wrested from the grasp of rebellion and reclaimed in the name of the crown. Thus, in the crucible of conflict, Beaumaris stood as both witness and testament to the eternal struggle for power and dominion. In the hallowed halls of Beaumaris Castle, amidst the shadows cast by its ancient stones, a somber tale of faith and sacrifice unfolds. March of the year, 1592, marked a fateful turn in the life of William Davies, a Welsh Roman Catholic priest and martyr. Within the fortress's formidable walls, he was ensnared by the machinations of religious intolerance, condemned for his unwavering devotion to his beliefs. As the days stretched into weeks, and the spectre of impending doom loomed ever closer, William Davies stood resolute in his convictions. Yet, on the 27th of July, 1593, the echoes of injustice reverberated through the corridors as he met his fate. Hanged, drawn and quartered, his martyrdom etched a poignant chapter in the annals of history, a testament to the enduring struggle for religious freedom and the unyielding spirit of those who dare to defy the oppressor. And thus, within the confines of Beaumaris Castle, William Davies found his place among the ranks of the martyred, a beacon of courage and conviction that continues to illuminate the darkest corners of the past. Amidst the tumult of the English Civil War, Beaumaris Castle became a bastion of loyalty to the embattled monarch, Charles I. Its stout walls bore witness to the clash of ideologies, standing firm against the tide of parliamentary forces until the year 1646, when the inevitable surrender was made. Yet, even in defeat, the spirit of resistance lingered. In 1648, as royalist fervour once again flared, the castle found itself embroiled in local rebellion. Remarkably, despite the tumultuous times, Beaumaris Castle escaped the fate of many of its counterparts, spared from the ignominy of demolition. Instead, the winds of change brought a new era. Garrisoned by Parliament, the castle languished in neglect, its once formidable silhouette, now a haunting echo of former glory. By the dawn of the year 1660, its fate seemed sealed as ruin set in, a silent testament to the ravages of time and conflict. Yet, from the ashes of ruin, a phoenix arose. In the 19th century, the castle found new life as part of a stately home and park, its crumbling stones now a backdrop to the genteel pursuits of a bygone era. Today, as the 21st century dawns, Beaumaris Castle endures as a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. Though battered by the winds of history, 
Its ruins stand as a poignant reminder of the trials and triumphs that have shaped our shared heritage, drawing visitors from far and wide to marvel at its storied past. In the annals of British fortification, Beaumaris Castle emerges as a masterpiece of strategic design, a symphony of symmetry and strength sculpted from the rugged stones of its native land. As historian Arnold Taylor aptly observed, it stands as the pinnacle of symmetrical concentric planning, a testament to the ingenuity of its architects. Crafted from the very bedrock of Anglesey, its imposing form rises from the embrace of a moated outer ward, guarded by 12 stalwart towers and two formidable gatehouses. Yet, it is within the inner sanctum that Beaumaris truly reveals its splendor, a bastion of power crowned by two grand D-shaped gatehouses and six towering edifices of stone. Within these walls, the heartbeat of the castle pulses with life. Designed to accommodate not one, but two noble households, its inner ward boasts ranges of domestic buildings and accommodations fit for kings and queens alike, a testament to both its strategic prowess and practical functionality. But Beaumaris's reach extended beyond its stone confines. Positioned at the threshold of the sea, its south gate opened wide to the embrace of the waves, offering a lifeline of supply and reinforcement from distant shores, a gateway to sustenance and survival. Recognized by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization as a jewel in Europe's crown, Beaumaris Castle stands as a beacon of late 13th and early 14th century military architecture, a testament to the artistry and engineering prowess of its creators. Enshrined as a world heritage site, its towers and battlements continue to stand sentinel, guarding the secrets of the past and inviting all who behold its majesty to step back in time and marvel at its enduring legacy. In the annals of history, the struggle for dominion over North Wales unfolds as a saga of rivalry and conquest, echoing through the centuries from the depths of the 1070s. Yet, it was the 13th century that bore witness to a renewed fervor, a clash of titans culminating in the intervention of Edward I, a monarch determined to assert his authority over these ancient lands. With a mighty army at his back, Edward descended upon North Wales like a tempest, marching northward from Carmarthen and westward from Montgomery and Chester. His resolve was unwavering, his intentions clear, to establish English dominion in perpetuity upon these contested shores. And so, on the hallowed grounds of Rudlan, the course of history was altered forever. Enshrined in the Statute of Rudlan, enacted on the 3rd of March 1284, were the provisions for the governance of Wales, a blueprint for colonization and control. The land was carved into counties and shires, mirroring the administrative structure of England, with the birth of three new shires in the northwest Caernarfon, Merioneth, and Anglesey. Amidst this sea of change, new bastions of power arose. The stones of Caernarfon and Harlech bore witness to the birth of fortified towns, their walls standing sentinel over the burgeoning administrative centres of the first two shires. In nearby Conwy, another castle rose from the earth, its ramparts a testament to the might of Edward's vision. Yet, amidst the grandeur of these undertakings, a shadow lingered over the town of Landfayers. Crowned as the wealthiest borough in Wales, its streets teemed with life, a bustling hub of trade and commerce. Positioned upon the crossroads of North Wales and the gateway to Ireland, it stood as a beacon of prosperity and promise. Plans were laid for its fortification, its transformation into a bastion of English authority. But the weight of ambition proved too heavy a burden. As resources were diverted to the construction of other castles, the dream of a fortified Landfayers was postponed, relegated to the annals of might-have-beens. Thus, amidst the grand tapestry of history, the legacy of Edward's intervention endures a testament to the clash of empires, the birth of nations, and the dreams deferred in the wake of ambition's cost. In the turbulent year of 1294, 
a spark ignited in the heart of Wales, an ember of rebellion that would set the land ablaze. Madog ap Llywelyn, fueled by a fervent desire for freedom, rose against the yoke of English rule, his banner stained with the blood of defiance. Amongst the casualties of this bitter conflict was Roger de Pulaston, the steadfast sheriff of Anglesey, whose life was claimed in the throes of battle. Undeterred by the tempest of rebellion, King Edward moved swiftly to quell the uprising. With the winter winds howling their lament, the flames of resistance were snuffed out, and by the dawn of April 1295, Anglesey lay once more in the firm grip of English authority. Yet, in the aftermath of conflict, the seeds of transformation were sown. The chosen site for fortification bore the name Bumaris, a serene moniker that belied the tumultuous history to come. Translated from the Norman French as Fair Marsh, this verdant land became the canvas upon which Edward's vision was to be etched, a vision immortalized in Latin as De Bello Marisco. But progress demanded sacrifice. Lanfes, nestled in the shadow of Beaumaris, was to bear the brunt of change. Its Welsh inhabitants, displaced to make way for the burgeoning English settlement, were resettled some 12 miles distant, amidst the fertile fields of Newborough. Thus, the stage was set for the birth of a new era, a prosperous English town, ensconced within the protective embrace of a formidable castle. As the echoes of displacement faded into the annals of time, Beaumaris rose from the ashes of conflict, a beacon of English dominance. Its ramparts a testament to the enduring legacy of conquest and colonization. And so, amidst the ebb and flow of history, the story of Beaumaris Castle stands as a testament to the inexorable march of progress and the price paid in pursuit of power and dominion. Perched on the edge of the town, Beaumaris Castle emerged as a beacon of power and authority, its strategic placement echoing the grandeur of its counterparts. Inspired by the town plan of Conwy, its layout mirrored the meticulous designs of a master architect. Yet, unlike its sister settlement, the fortifications of Beaumaris lacked the embrace of stone walls in its infancy, though the whisper of their presence lingered in the foundations beneath. In the balmy summer of 1295, the symphony of construction began to crescendo under the watchful gaze of Master James of St. George, a maestro of masonry appointed by the king himself. Thank you for joining us on this remarkable journey through Beaumaris Castle. We trust you found our video enlightening and captivating. Your engagement means the world to us, so please do drop us a comment, leave a like, and hit that subscribe button to stay tuned for more captivating content. For further adventures and behind the scenes glimpses, check out our social links in the description below. Until next time, happy exploring.